Um, so this lecture is about CMOS technology, and we're going to talk about what that is in a little while, but I thought I might give you a bit of a you know, history lesson, how we got to where we are. So there was a guy called Jack, and Jack in the 50s uh, developed the first transistor. And since then, we've gone from sort of big bulky electronics to everything fitting on your mobile phone. So it's pretty incredible. Now back in 2003, when you guys were still at, were you at high school? 2003? Okay. So when you were in 2003, um, the, the state of the art was the Intel Pentium 4. Anyone, everyone remember those clunky old things? So those things had 55 million transistors on them, okay? Which is not too shabby. Um, but last year, the Intel Core i7, which has six cores, um, had 1,170 million transistors on it. And that's why we can do so many cool things. So back in 2003, things were not as cool as they are today. So basically, we've been sort of 50% growth over the last 45 years in the amount of transistors that we can fit on a single integrated circuit. Um, and this has been driven by kind of physics and money and, you know, people like Bill Gates and people like you guys. So the uh, first half of the century is something called vacuum tubes and even I'm not old enough to know what those things look like. I've, I, I've tried to actually you know, bring one in but no one seems to have them anymore and now they're kind of cool because they're so uncool that they're cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I can't find any of those. This is a picture of one of the first transistors um, some lumps of silicon and um, this is sort of what started everything. This is why we have this course. Yo. There's, there's a couple in display next to the electrical engineering office. Really? Yeah. Has anyone ever looked at the display next to the engineering office? Okay, two, it's three. It's a very large one. Actually. Okay. <laughs> so after this, let's all go have a look. <laughs> um, <laughs> so back in the day though, they used to teach that sort of thing here. So um, yeah, cool. So, how big are they? Well, that's the, that one's a, it's a transmission tube, the high power transmission tube that's very okay, large. Right. The, base, the smallest they came was about the size of the grain of rice. But okay. That was towards the very end of their life. Right. So, grain of rice was the smallest they could get. So, you couldn't really imagine fitting over a thousand million grains of rice to make, to make a you know, smartphone. So anyway, this is what sort of an early transistor looked like. And there's two kinds of transistors. Have you guys done this in some kind of... Wow. I'm the first person to tell you this stuff. I'm so privileged. So there's something called bipolar transistors, which people tell you too much about because not many people use them these days except for power electronics. Um, they're fun, though. Lots of fun. So that's why they tell you about them. Um, the MOS metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, despite having an extremely large name of the best kind of transistors there are, and that's pretty much what this lecture is going to be about. So these are the two different kinds of transistors, and this is sort of what started the whole integrated circuit revol revolution. Now, back in the 60s, an integrated circuit consisted of one, one circuit. So this is a logic gate. So you guys have been in your labs programming FPGAs which have, you know, thousands of logic gates on it. Back in the day, the day being the 1960s, they had like one gate on an on a integrated circuit. So you can imagine what that lab was like. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we've come a long way since, since one gate on an on a integrated circuit. So the 70s, uh, they used a particular kind of um, transistor, uh, NMOS, and we'll talk about what those are in a bit. Um, and as you can see, they're starting to fit quite a lot of transistors on them. Um, and these pictures always look really cool. And someone says, what do you do when you kind of show on a picture like this? It's very cool. Uh, since the 1980s, we've been using this CMOS thing, and that's what we're talking about today. So, um, I just wanted to, I, I like pictures, so I just put lots of pictures in. So the first computer, this is what it looked like. 
Um, imagine fitting that in your pocket, you know. <laughs> you know, calling up the internet with one of these things. It's pretty cool though because it kind of worked and uh, it was rather expensive though for the day. I think it was 17,000 pounds. So it was a lot of money and basically could do uh, addition and multiplication and division and yeah, so you can't do too much with it. It's not going to revolutionize your world. So that was the first computer. Um, and then back in the 50s, um, this, this is the first electronic computer, which was um, invented by the, the Navy. The N in that acronym there stands for Navy, and that's all I know. Um, but basically, it took up a whole room, and it employed lots of people who stood and pushed cards in and out of slots. Um, not the most exciting job in the world, but I guess somebody had to do it. So nowadays, actually, um, your smartphone can do more than this whole room and those four people. So it's pretty incredible how fast things have happened. So now, there's this thing called Moore's Law. Has anyone heard of it before? I would hope you would have. Yeah, that's right. So, and it's not really a law because, you know, it's... <laughs> so anyway, so it, it, they call it Moore's Law, and yes, the, the idea is, is that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every 18 months or so. So that's why we've kind of had this increase that continues to, well, it's kind of like an exponential increase. Um, and this is an old, um, old plot because I used to teach back in these days, so this, this used to be state of the art. So, so this, this sort of shows, and, and the trend continues upwards. So we keep on having, uh, doubling the number of transistors we have on our integrated circuits. So the guy's name was Gordon Moore, and he worked for Intel, I think, or was it IBM? I think it was Intel. And he doesn't like to be known for the law, but let's face it, he wouldn't be known otherwise. <laughs> so he should just be glad about that. Um, if any of you ever get famous for something trivial like that, don't, don't diss it, you know. It's, most of us never get known for anything. So anyway, he's a bit, you know, you see him on the front of magazines saying, it's not all I did, but it's like, you yeah, know. Yeah. So anyway, so <laughs> his prediction continues to this day, which is incredible because we've sort of got to the stage where We've got integrated circuits that have sort of thickness between the gates of three angstroms and we can't get any smaller than that. So it's kind of cool uh, that this is continuing to go on and he's, his law goes on. One day you will see a heading, a title somewhere, newspaper flash, Moore's law is over or something like that or <laughs> it wasn't a law after all. Or but anyway, until that day, um, let's remember old Gordy for that. So, um, if we look at uh, the number of uh, bits per chip, um, back in the 80s, um, we had 64 kilobits on a chip. <laughs> um, that wouldn't fit anything useful on it at all today. Uh, and then, sort of, we've got this increase, and that line at the top, because this was a projection back in the mid um, noughties um, is actually should be more that way because we're actually in we're using 32 nanometer technologies at the moment so uh, we continue to be able to put more and more information on a single chip okay so the more transistors you can put on there the more information you can fit on there which is also kind of cool is it raining yeah. so um, in terms of microprocessors, uh, Moore's law continues to be a straight line. And actually, it kind of has increased a little bit. Um, the slope has gotten a little bit bigger. Uh, but basically, if you kind of do a, a linear um, regression on it, which is cool, linear regression, um, you'll find that you get two times growth every 1.96 years. Let's be technical. But, um, so that's the growth that we've got right now, and it continues to live on. 
Now, the way integrated circuits are made is that they, they get sand um, and they heat it up and they call it, create these really big pure silicon, I don't know, it looks, what does it look like? There's one in, there's one in the wall level too. Yeah, it, it kind of, <laughs> see how I don't walk around and look at the walls? Um, it kind of looks like toothpaste coming out of a tube, actually. And then they cut it into wafers, okay, round wafers. And then they basically, like, like a photo, they put an integrated circuit onto that wafer. So all of these little squares here are a single chip, and then you cut them all up. So one of the ways, and it's kind of cheating, that Moore's Law has lived on, is that they just increased the size of the dies. Cheat. Massive cheat. Yeah, I think it's got something to do with the crystals. So um, the silicon is like a, it forms a crystalline structure, and I think it's the way the bonds between the crystals. But I agree, it's like the Japanese with the watermelon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I guess the Japanese haven't done the watermelon trick with the silicon thing, but yeah. That, that certainly would save a lot of wastage. I mean, all these bits, they, they just get chucked away because you can't use them. So anyway, that's how Moore's Law has cheated. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that Moore had something to do with it, um, despite his protests. Now, the other big thing is, is the amount of power that you use. So as you've got more transistors, you're going to use more power. And, and as your kind of computing power has gone up, so the amount of data that you can have on a chip goes up, the amount of power that you need for that has gone up as well. So we had this uh, 1985, it was a great year. Um, power went down. Um, but otherwise, oh, I've got animation. Um, so, so there was kind of a downturn between the old 286 and the 386. Does anyone have any of those in their... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. What is it? 8088. Oh, okay. So, so they, they had sort of a breakthrough. Um, they were able to save a bit of power. But generally, the trend has been upwards and onwards. And it sort of is sort of exemplified by the fact that I had to buy a new computer, like a server, um, for my research. And the option, one of the options included liquid cooling which was very cool. Did Nani tell you about that? He said he yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's liquid cooling because it gets very hot. So obviously, um, these, these babies use a lot of power. So this is pretty much shown the same thing. This shows you the amount of power in watts. And you can kind of see, uh, you know, back in the day, you were nice and low power and, you know, less than a watt, less than 10 watts. Now we're at like 18 kilowatts, um, which is just, Insane. Yeah. So, when we had that little dip, and this was the projection back in 2000, and it's pretty much kept to that projection. If anything, it's actually hotter than they thought it would be. Um, so, back in what was that sort of the mid 90s, the sort of temperature that you could get up to was the, the temperature of a hot plate. So, you could actually cook eggs on your chip. So, very cool. Um, but then, um, so early in the noughties, uh, the power density was like a nuclear reactor, right? So you could use it to, to zap people and give them radiation burns or something. And then sort of, I guess now we're sort of at rocket nozzle um, power density. That's why we need liquid cooling, obviously. Uh, so this, this is obviously a problem and uh, one of the biggest things is because your transistors are so small um, they can kind of get damaged by heat so you need these, you got these little little chips and you've got these massive heat sinks on them and then you've got fans and liquid cooling so this is one of the design problems that you have as a designer so this course is digital circuit design so if you're a digital circuit designer you've actually got to think about ways to save power now because this is a huge issue for us. Um, so that's, that's it. The, the lecture is not exciting. Not that that was particularly exciting, but 
that's sort of, it's, we've peaked now. Um, so, when you're, what we've been doing in this course is that we've been, in your labs, you've been sort of looking at sort of the system level, so you've had your FPGA, and it's like this delightful black box that things happen inside it and you don't have to worry about it. Um, now, in this course, you've sort of looked at sort of modules, okay, so adders or um, subtractors or things like that, and the gate level. So, when I was doing this course, I always wondered what was inside the gates. Has anyone wondered that? Yeah, see, I, I was like this dude here. I, I was always thinking, yeah, but there's got to be something inside there. So, today's lecture is about what's inside the gates, which is actual transistors, okay? And then, of course, those transistors are actually physical things that get made into chips and get rocket nozzle density power, um, rocket nozzle power densities. Okay, so when you're making chips, when you're a digital designer, you can do it in two ways, and you guys should be experts on this. You either start writing a program, and keeping in mind that this program is a description of hardware. Okay, it's not like C, it's actually important to be efficient, because writing an efficient code means you're going to have efficient hardware. So you can either do that, and this here is VHDL, I think. Right, VHDL is gross and sucks, and so that's why we don't teach it. Verilog is much better. Or you can do schematic design, which you've also seen in your labs. So you can either write a program, or you can get your little gates and you can put them together. And then you take your gates and you change them into transistors. So inside each one of those gates is some transistors. Okay? So that's physically what's inside all the gates. And then each of those transistors, you need to work out what physically how to implement it. So this is what we call layout. And layout is a physical implementation of all those transistors. And it's pretty colorful boxes. Um, so I spent hours drawing boxes with pretty colors. And that's work. So this here is a transistor. Okay. So every time in your design you want to put transistors down, then you have to draw with pretty colors um, what the transistor is. So all the colors represent something different. So blue is, is metal, and pink is a different kind of metal. A different kind of metals so that you can run metals over metals and they don't make a connection, you see. And then red is called polysilicon. Okay? The green is the green is active. But you don't need to know about this until fourth year. Suffice to say that it's very pretty. So you get your gates, you change them into transistors, and then you draw pretty boxes, and then you have to do it for all the transistors. So this is a very simple chip that I did that has, you know, maybe a few thousand transistors on it. But all those transistors were drawn by hand. So as digital designers, you get to write code, and then you get to synthesize that so you never have to draw the boxes. But I think you miss out when you do that. But that's just a personal thing. So what are these magical things called transistors? Um, in your analog courses, they'll tell you a lot of detail. From a digital point of view, think of it a, a transistor as a switch. Okay? Turn them on and off. Okay? Because this course is all about zeros and ones. So, up here we've got an NMOS transistor. Okay? So that green stuff that I called active is basically silicon that has extra electrons. Okay? So it's got extra electrons flying around that aren't bonded with anything. Okay, so it means that electrons move freely inside them. So an NMOS transistor, a little symbol up there next to NMOS transistor. I don't have a laser pointer because that would be dangerous for everyone's eyes. So this here is, is the symbol that we use for it. And basically what you do is you apply a voltage to the gate. So that polysilicon, the red stuff in the picture before, that's your gate. And basically you put a high voltage on the gate means that you get current flowing between the source and the drain. Okay, so electrons flow between the source and the drain. We all know that some genius ages ago decided the current was positive, which means that actually the positive current flows between the drain and the source. But you know what I mean, right? So that's an NMOS transistor, okay? The complement of the NMOS transistor is the PMOS transistor, which works exactly the same way except it has active that has 
less electrons, absence of electrons, right? Have you guys done diodes yet? So, there's a, so when you don't have electrons somewhere, they call them holes, right? So, this P plus stuff is you've got extra holes, okay? So you get a current flowing between the source and the drain in the opposite direction, okay? So in this case, what you want to do is you want to apply a low voltage on the gate, and then you'll get conduction between the source and the drain, okay? And that's why the symbols are so convenient. Right? PMOS has this little, little bubble, okay? like the bubbles that we see on our AND gates and inverters and things. So that means that it's kind of zero active, okay? active low. And then the NMOS transistor, no bubble, active high. Okay? So when you get to, I guess you might do it later this year, but when you get to learning about these things more properly, um, you'll learn that by applying a voltage to the gate, you create an electric field, okay, which creates a channel between the source and the drain, which allows electrons to flow. Now, in digital, all we want to do is put either the highest voltage in the circuit on the gate or the lowest voltage in the circuit on the gate, because we're only interested in zeros and ones. Okay? So that's all you need to know. You put a high voltage on the gate and an MOS transistor and you get current flowing through it, so it's like closing a switch. Okay, if you put a low voltage on the MOS transistor, then it's kind of like opening the switch and you can have no current through, um, through the source and the drain. Okay, absolute opposite way around for the PMOS transistor. Okay, put a low voltage on the gate and you get current flowing. Okay, so you've closed the switch and you put a high voltage and you've opened the switch. Okay, that's as easy as it gets and you'll have all this crap thrown at you and all these awful equations over the next couple of years and all those awful equations are really telling you is high voltage, current, low voltage, no current. Um, and there's some pretty graphs and things. And, but if you remember that then you, you'll be able to do transistors. Okay? So, now Right now, it should be obvious how we can use these things in logic design. If we have a circuit where we have a voltage on our gate, okay, we put ground on the source, and we want to look at what the output is at F. Okay? So when we put a high voltage, then the output of F is low. Okay? So a high voltage on X means that there's current flowing between the drain and the source, so it's like a closed switch. Right? And so that brings F down to ground. Okay? When we have a low voltage on here, it means that there's no conduction between D and S, which means that uh, F is just left floating. Okay? NC stands for no connection or some such thing. Okay? So it's just floating. So now for the PMOS transistor, exactly opposite way around. If we put a low voltage on the gate, then we're going to have conduction between the output F and VDD. Okay? And if we put a high voltage there, then the switch is open. And so we've got no connection and F is left floating. So now, yes? What is VDD? Um, so VDD is the highest uh, voltage in the circuit. Well. So VCC, well, it's a historical thing, right? So back in the day, <laughs> back in the day, they used to have, ugh, ugh I hate this thing. Um, back in the day, they used to have, well, I told you, bipolar junction transistors. So those, those babies look like, um, wow, this is the smallest piece of chalk ever. <laughs> Okay, so you draw them like this, and they have a base, a collector, and an emitter. Okay, so they said that the highest voltage was VCC. Now, those of us that follow the book of MOSFET um, have decided that VCC is belonging to the times of the bipolar transit, you know, old stuff. 
So we use VDD. Same thing there. Yeah. Actually, sometimes you'll see people use VCC instead of VDD. Yeah. But we use it in N1 cell. But N1 cell, really. Yeah. So <laughs> no. So you can use VCC. You can use VDD. It doesn't matter. Um, if it's got a letter twice, usually means that it's you know biggest voltage in the circuit. Okay. So. Um, Traditionally, you have VCC with the bipolars, you have VDDs with the MOSFETs, but it's not going to really, as long as you know. So, um, now, you might have noticed something interesting here. You probably haven't because you're kind of sleepy because you just had lunch. Um, and it's kind of rainy and it's kind of cold. Um, so, I'll just go back and show you. So, um, the NMOS device is active when the voltage between the gate and the source, so VGS, is greater than some threshold voltage, which is just intrinsic to the silicon. So you just need to put a voltage above this value and you get conduction. So S, okay, in, in our um, digital circuits, uh, we usually put the NMOS transistors down to the lowest potential, okay? So that's why we connect it to ground. And then all you have to do is put um, G at VDD, you see, and then you get conduction. So for the PMOS transistors, you can see it's the other way around. Okay, so VGS has to be less than the threshold voltage. So then we put S at a high voltage, and then all we have to do is put G at ground and we get conduction. Okay, so that's why it ends up that we connect the source of the MOS transistor down to ground, and the source of the PMOS transistor up to VDD. Okay? So, is that all clear happening for you? Yeah? It seems odd, but it's just the sort of physical properties of having N type and P type devices. So, um, we can combine these two things together because, as Nani would have drummed into you, having floating connections is very, very bad. Um, so when we connect them together, we get rid of that sort of no connection sort of thing. So we have, when we put the gate at low, that means we're going to get conduction through the PMOS transistor. Okay, so we had a low at the input, which means we get a high at the output. Okay, and when we've got a, low, a high at the input, we end up getting a low at the output. And ladies and gentlemen, we have an inverter. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the beginning of the whole universe, you see, now we've got this awesome way of creating circuits. The best thing about this though is, can anyone see why this is an awesome way to do a circuit? I mean, except that, you know, it's, it looks pretty. Oh. That's right, yeah. So we, we never have any uh, current between X and F because we're kind of, it's kind of basically, you've seen how they are physically, right? You've got this gate that creates an electric field. So they're kind of insulated from one another, which is good. And the other good thing is, is that you've only got, because we're using ones and zeros all the time, so we're VDD in ground, VDD in ground, VDD in ground. You never have current flowing between VDD and ground, okay? So they call that static power consumption. Okay, so remember that current likes to flow through the path of least resistance. Like a lot of people choosing their subjects. Which ones are the easiest ones, you see? <laughs> so that's how current works, okay? Current is always looking for the easy way out. Okay, so when current sees, ooh, I can get to ground, then it, it takes it. Right? So this kind of circuit minimizes the, the path for current to flow, which minimizes power consumption, yes. This, this would pretty much be the same way if this was a buffer down there. If you replace that, um, the PMOS with the NMOS, would that what you would be working out? Can you make, make it as a buffer as well? It would be very difficult to do that. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't give you all the equations, but um, if, if, because this is a digital class, and. I didn't want to get technical. But basically, let me see if I can use this little piece of... Um, so, this is an NMOS transistor, right? And if I put the drain to VDD, 
right? In order to, to make current flow through here, I need to have uh, VDS being a large value. And so even if I put this at VDD, the gate, then I won't get very much current flowing through here and it'll look like a big resistor. Right? So it's not going to buffer well. But, so that's the bad thing about these things. They only work complementary. But to make a buffer, you just get two of these babies. Yeah. So, wow, I kind of skipped ahead, didn't I? It's called an invert. Okay, so Nonny wrote these. Um, so anyway, so basically this says everything that I've said and no electrical clash, which is kind of a good name for a 70s band. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I was born in the 70s, so you know, I remember them. Not really, no. So anyway, so we can generalize now and we can say that we can create any kind of circuit by putting p-type transistors or so p-mosses up the top okay and we call them the pull up network and nmos is down the bottom we call it the pull down network okay so you can do any kind of logic function and that logic function will be complementary meaning there's going to have a bar on the top of it okay um, and you can do that using this kind of pull up and pull down structure okay um, so all the pull up uh, network uh, will be connecting the output to logic 1 or VDD and the pull down network connects the output to 0 or ground okay um, and they are mutually exclusive okay just like our inverter okay only one of those network conducts at a time and that means that we don't have none of that static power consumption okay so damn it says oh, oh who can guess what it is alright so I, this is this is my bad because I was too lazy to bring the you know that thing that Nani uses but I think that thing looks a bit odd so I didn't want to bring it um, now I'm sorry okay so this is an AND gate okay so an AND gate um, can everyone see why it's an AND gate so um, any time I've got a low okay at, at one of the inputs I'm going to get conduction through one of the either one of these um, transistors, yeah? You want to see that? And I have to have, because, it, so these two PMOSs, they're in parallel, right? I have to have both NMOSs on to get, get down to ground, okay? So it, uh, it means that basically, well, it's an AND gate. I was trying to make it sound exciting, but no, it's just a simple little NAND gate. So, there was something else I wanted to say now, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. So notice that in our pull-up and pull-down network, we're kind of the complement of the other one. So if I've got the pull-down network as being in series, then the pull-up network has to be in parallel. Okay? So let's see how far this little piece of chalk can take us. Um, if I had this uh -oh. next time I'll come prepared uh oh I'm just drawing with well, nothing now. Um. Okay. <laughs> All right, so if I had that circuit, does anyone want to guess what it is? Yeah, so it's a null gate. And notice that our friend the null gate has parallel NMOSs and series so in the exam when you get to the question that asks about the circuit that was mine by the way um, so enjoy it also when you get there just remember that you've done it right if you can sort of look at the different uh, pull-up networks and pull-down networks 
And every time you've got a series connection, make sure the top's parallel. Okay, and vice versa. Okay? That's all I can do for writing on the board now. That's it. Okay. Ah, oh, what the hell? <laughs> I hate using other people's slides. Okay, so that's an all gate drawn properly. Um, okay, and obviously you just add another transistor for each input, okay? And it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Interesting though, um, because current is flowing through these devices, so in order to pull F down to, to ground here, we need X, Y, and Z having high voltages on them. You actually make the devices physically bigger so you can get enough current through them. So the more things you have in series, the kind of bigger the transistors have to be. Not that that's anything you have to worry about in this course, but it's kind of why on your FPGAs, most of the things will be made out of two input gates and they just connect two input gates together everywhere because it's easier. Okay? So, so this is sort of a, a summary of what we've said. So it's, it's, it's naturally inverting, okay? So it always gives you the complement of the input. Um, and so it can only implement functions that have an N in front of it not NAND, NOR, and so on. Um, and the reason for using NOT and NOT inverter is that it doesn't start with N, I imagine. Um, so in order to have a, a, like a, a non-barred function, you need to put an inverter at the end. Okay. So that's a big pain in the neck. So you try to do everything with NAND gates. Have you had that tutorial yet? We have to do everything NAND gates. Well, why am I doing everything NAND? This is why. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny we tell you the, the end of the story before why we got there. But anyway, so that, that's why we do everything in NANDs or NORs or whatever. That's why there's possibly an exam question that says, do the function using NAND gates. Now you'll understand why that's important. Okay? So when you're compiling on your FPGA, that's what inside there, the compiler's going, I've got to do this it's all in NAND gates. Okay? So it just makes things a lot easier. And I've told you ideal things here. So this is an ideal circuit. But though that, that red stuff, that polysilicon, is like a capacitor. Okay? And it kind of restricts how quickly you can switch your circuits. Okay? That's why the transistors are getting smaller and smaller. So the capacitors get smaller and smaller. So you can switch faster and faster. Okay? So the more of these gates that you have, the more delay you have. Okay? Remember first year <coughs> RC circuits? This is essentially a big fat RC circuit. Okay? When you turn on the switch, it's a resistor, and that output drives the gate, okay? one of these inputs, and these have little capacitors on them. Okay? So that's the story that I don't think you hear for a few years. But, um, that's why we do things the way we do them. Um, The actual switches. Yeah, so it's it's the gate capacitor. So, um, so because the gate is is like an insulator, right? So you don't get any current flowing through the gate, but the gate itself is made out of polysilicon, which is inherently capacitive. Okay. So when they when somebody says to you. Oh, this is an awesome transistor. It's made out of 22 nano, nanometer technology. 22 nanometer is the, is the channel length size, so that's how small you make the gate. So the smaller you make the gate, the smaller the capacitance is. Okay? So that's why you can run things faster. So the gate... Uh, the gates, yeah. Um, but the wires can, so one of the big problems that we're having at the moment and why you're doing your assignment actually on asynchronous stuff, you're doing that partially because it's mean and nasty and partially because it was Nani's homework and partially because it's an important part. 
So one of the big problems at the moment is you have these little, little chips. But on these little, little chips, you've got you know, a billion transistors. Okay? And all of these chips use a clocks. And so getting a clock across a whole chip is actually really, really difficult. And you've got to put in sort of buffers to keep the voltages high enough. And so you end up using at least 40% of your power just on distributing the clock. Okay? So that's why you want to go to things like asynchronous design because you get to say, yeah, bugger off clock. You save 40% of the power. Happy days. Okay? So um, wire resistance is huge especially when you're talking about a clock across a whole chip. So there's, there's a bunch of things that a digital designer has to be aware of, and that, that being the physical realities of what you're dealing with. So we teach you kind of, you know, kind of oompa loompa circuit design here, um, in that I was just watching the Big Bang Theory for lunch. <laughs> you know, the one where Sheldon comes in and goes, oh, this is engineering. Hello, engineers, the Oompa Loompas oh, of physics. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand why Wolowitz just doesn't go get a PhD. Does anyone, does anyone sit there and yeah, yeah I know, but come on. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, so we're, we're teaching you kind of the ideal stuff here, but the real important stuff from a digital designer's point of view is how to deal with resistances and capacitances, okay? How to deal with delays. Because the reason why we have computers on our phones now is because we can switch things really quickly. And I'm going to fall over with this thing one day. Okay, and the reason why we can switch things really quickly is because really good digital designers are out there working out how to deal with resistances in wires and capacitors on the gates of transistors, okay? So this is sort of the, the first step at looking at how how to be like a, a digital designer. Okay, and I think we know everything this slide says. So we move on. Okay, so the fancy way of saying taking the opposite, like if you've got a parallel connection, then you have a series connection, is saying the dual. Okay? So the pull up network is obtained by taking the dual of the pull down network, okay? Using PMOS transistors. Don't get it mixed up, people. Last year I had people putting transistors of different kinds all over the place. Pull-up transistors are the ones with little circles, the PMOS, okay? And the, the pull-down ones are the N, NMOS transistors, okay? Um, okay, we've said all this. So, um, this would be something like you'd have in an exam, so you could either get the function and then say, draw the circuit, or you could get the circuit and you could say, what function does it represent? So, does everyone understand how we got from that thing to this thing here? Uh -huh. I'll give you some thinking time. Is it bouncing around for everyone else? All right, so what I do is I just design the pull-down network because nobody, there's not a human alive that thinks in PMOSes. And when you're in like electronics like later on this year and next year, you'll hate PMOSes because they're all backwards and it confuses you. So do everything in NMOSes and then translate back. So this is your function here. So or, first of all, you know you're going to have a bar on the back of things, okay? So if you're given a function that doesn't have a bar over it, you know the output needs to have an inverter. I think we did that nasty scheme with last year's. Anyway, don't screw that up. It's like a mark and, you know, it's an easy mark. So if it's got a bar on it, then you just think, okay, so if I make D high, right, then the output is low. Okay, so you just have D in parallel, right? Then you, e you need A multiplied by B or C, so either of these, to get F low. Okay? So every time you see an OR, you make a parallel connection in that pull-down network. Okay? And every time you see an AND, you put a series connection. 
in the pull-down network. That's why it's easy to work with the pull-down network. And then you draw the pull-down network and then every time you've got a parallel connection, you make it serial. Okay, and every time you've got a series connection, you make it parallel. It's, it's, it's that simple. Unless we said, here's the pull-up network and then your whole life is screwed. I don't know whether I did that. Maybe you shouldn't listen to me. Um, but, I mean, you could do it the other way, but it seems to be wrong to think in PMOSes. So does everyone kind of see how that circuit does that function? No, no objections? Should have put a mistake in there. Damn, next year. Don't tell them. All right, so the other thing that you can do is you can have these things called transmission gates. Okay, so say, have you done multiplexes? Yeah, right. So say you want a signal to go somewhere or somewhere else, right? You can use switches just to pass signals through, okay? Now you can use single switches, but then you get a voltage drop, okay? And that goes back into physics and long equations. Um, so if you use both the P and the N, then you shouldn't get much of a voltage drop, okay? Should be a low resistance switch, okay? And they're called transmission gates, and they also have this pretty symbol here. And my thing with this symbol, I just gotta sort of rant for a bit, but this symbol doesn't make things easier. You know, like if you're gonna have a symbol, make it easier. I don't understand, like the transistors is easier to draw. But anyway, so if you see that symbol, that crazy looking symbol, that's transmission gate, that's transmission gate, okay? And just allows signals to throw, flow through, okay? Oh, words. Yeah, okay, so um, this particular transmission gate, and always be careful when you're looking at circuits in the exam, where the bars are on top of the, single, the signals, that, that makes a big difference. So if you've got a high, if C is high, then that means the n mouse transistor closes, right? That switch closes. And C bar then it therefore is low and therefore the PMOS switch closes, okay? So you need to have the signal to be the complement on each side, okay? So if you're gonna use this as a multiplexer, like a two, two bit multiplexer, then you'd have another PMOS connected to to the C, and then C bar would be connected to an NMOS, okay? And then you could select which way the signal goes. Oh, wow, it's like it read it, my, my, mind. I think this is the last slide, yay. Okay, so, um, so this is a, oh no, this isn't, this isn't a multiplexer, this is an XOR gate. Same sort of concept though, okay? Um, so there's this thing called, it's almost overdue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can sit around and we can talk about, you know, Jack Kirby. Okay, so this is all in your exam. Thanks very much. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell these guys what I told you. <laughs> It's all right, it's, you've not missed anything. It's, it's just me ranting. So, okay, last, last circuit. So this is a, an XOR gate, and this is kind of a different way of doing logic. So you can actually do an XOR gate with transistors, kind of the pull-up network, pull-down network, where I encourage you to go home and try. Um, this is another way to do it, which actually uses less, um, less transistors, okay? So... XOR gate, okay, so they both have to be different values to get the signal through, okay? So if we have A being high, okay, and, no, oh no, let's start at the beginning. So if A is low and B is low, okay, so B is low means that this um, pass gate is coming through here, which means the low on A gets fed to the output. You want to see that? Yep. And then if A is low and B is high, that means this transmission gate turns off and this one turns on, right? 
which means you invert the low on A and it goes to the output, so you get it high at the output. Yeah? Right, and then if, if A is high and B is low, okay, that means this guy here turns on, A is low, uh, high, and that means the high goes to the output there. Okay? And if A is high and B is high, that means we go through this path here. Okay? Make sure you, you can see where all that comes from. Now, does anyone want to tell me how many transistors this XOR gate uses? Yes. I'm just making sure you've been paying attention. Thanks very much. Love your work. Have a good week. Um, I'll see you on um, Friday if you want to come along for some more craziness. I'll see you at the barbecue.